1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 are our guide this morning. I encourage you to take your Bible and turn there with me to 1 John 4. You can also look along with me in the Pew Bible that is in front of you. It's on page 1023, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and following. I want you to go back with me. I'm eight years old. I'm roaming as a third grader the halls of Northside Elementary School. It's Valentine's Day. And what does a third grader do on Valentine's Day? He does nothing else than to express his undying love and affection for Jessica. It was Jessica for me. Jessica sat three rows over from me in my homeroom class. I don't recall that I had ever talked to her before, but this was going to be the day. This was going to be the day that I told her just how special she was to me. First crush, we all have Valentine's cards. There are bags that you put your Valentine's cards in the night before. I'm making out the class list. I get to school and I put all of the cards in the appropriate bags except for hers. I was going to hand deliver it to her. I muster the courage up. It's maybe 2 o'clock. The day's almost gone, and I see my opportunity as she was walking. I intersect with her, and as an 8-year-old would do, I just bumped into her. Her books drop everywhere. She bends down to get the books. I bend down to get the books. We look at each other. Our eyes connect, and here is the moment. And she looks at me, and she says, thank you so much, Brian. Mm. Mm. Shot to the heart, Jessica gave love a really bad name to me right in that moment, third grade. That ended my hopes for any kind of relationship with Jessica. Fast forward, year of our Lord 2018, I've been your pastor for a year. I'm running up Salter Road. Somebody's running the opposite direction. Young guy meets me eye to eye and he says, hey, good to see you, Brian. Hey, yeah, good to see you also, man. Keep on running. The next day, he's running. He runs the same way. I'm going up Salter. He's coming the other way. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you too. Not the next day, but for the next six months, at least every week, I run into this same guy when I'm running every time with gusto, every time with tremendous enthusiasm. He says, Good to see you, Brian. <laughs> now, I tell you this story because it's five years old. I tell you this story because I haven't seen him in about five years. And, but for about six months between Salter and Lakeshore, we would have an almost daily occurrence. And I just never had the heart to tell him, hey, man, you got the wrong guy here. I'm not your Brian. One of the reasons we gather to worship, one of the reasons that we sing, one of the reasons that we open up God's word is to make sure that the God that we talk about is actually the God described in the Bible. To make sure that we don't have a, a mischaracterization, that what we say about God is actually not the God that is described in the Bible. Hey, all of us in this room know what it is to, to get someone confused all of us in this room, whether it was in your elementary school days or whether it was in the adult professional days, as a pastor, this is one of the vocational and calling hazards that occurs. I will have a conversation with someone and realize I've got them crossed up. I've got them confused. But woe to us if we're confused spiritually. Who is God? What is his nature? 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, is the word of the Lord that I want you to hear this morning. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. This is the word of the Lord to us this morning. It's a word that captures our hearts around three central questions I want to pose to you this morning. But more importantly, from the text, I want you to see the answers that are clear to us. The first question this morning is, what is the nature of God? What what is the nature of God? Notice verse 8. Three words that resound to us. Three words that are a clarion call of clarity to us this morning. God is, God is, God is love. Verse 7 through verse 8 is a repetition. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. This is a refrain that John picks up. I've told you this. I'm going to remind you probably again that John, when he wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he had no imagination of people turning in their New Testaments and following along. So this is oral communication. And what is one of the trademarks of oral communication? It it is repetition. Uh, Repetition is not redundant. It is a pathway to clarity. So this shouldn't surprise us that verse 7 is something that we've read before and that we've heard in a a distinct way in chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, in chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, John would tell us that the, the supreme way that you can see love is to see it through the cross. This is what love looks like. And so John comes back to this theme, but what he wants us to do, he wants us to go deeper, further up, further in. And he wants us to not just explore the depths of love for one another, but he wants us to go further up and further in to explore the very depths of the essence of God. What is the nature of God? God is love. J.I. Packer, who was a theologian and longtime seminary professor at Regent Divinity School in Vancouver, said in his wonderful book, Knowing God, that one of the most tremendous utterances in all of the Bible are these three words, God is love. What we're describing is the indescribable. What we're describing is the essence of God. What we're describing is the very nature of God. We're not, we're not saying that love is one of his attributes, We're not saying that this is one of his activities to us. We're not saying that God sometimes shows us his love in loving manners and mannerisms. No, that that all that encompasses God can be described in this phrase, God is love. That the essential element of the godness of God is love. And so it's tragic for us. If we go about talking about God and excise love from the description, it is tragic. It is, it is us being confused about who God is. It is us calling a, a David a Brian or a Brian a David. We're confused because God is love. Richard Dawkins is a biologist who was taught for years at Oxford University. He is a ardent atheist, self-professed. He's written a book called The God Delusion. And in his understanding of who God is, he describes God in these words. He is the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. He's jealous and he's proud of it. He's petty and unjust and unforgiving. He's a control freak, vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, racist, genocidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, capriciously malevolent bully. That is a creature with words uppercutting the creator, blow after blow. As Dawkins would say, there are apt descriptions that you would find in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and they are hints of truth, but his rhetoric has taken the truth and he's blown it out of proportion. Yes, God in the Bible is described as a judge. Yes, God in the Bible is described as holy. Yes, God in the Bible is described as a sovereign ruler. But what Dawkins has done in his description is with all of these descriptions, he's removed 
the essential element of God, his love. So God's wrath towards sinners is always a loving wrath. God's judgment is always a loving judgment. God's holiness is always a loving holiness. God's perfection is always a loving perfection. And more than that, what Dawkins leaves out is the primary way that God has revealed to us who he is, his love, in the sending of his son. Which leads to the second question to this text this morning. The first is, what's the nature of God? God is love. The second is, how does God display the depth of his love? Church, how does God display the depth of his love? Well, the answer is right here in the text. It's through his son. Verses 9 through 10, I want to remind you of the text. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. How do you know you're loved by someone? How do you know for sure that someone loves you? Is it because they tell you all the time? Is it because they always talk about love all the time? Or is it because you've seen as the object of their affection and love, you've you've been a recipient of it. Their, Their actions have proven over time that they are beloved by, that you are beloved by them. What what an amazing, uh, amazing passage for us to see that God doesn't just talk about love. But he shows us, he shows us in the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he shows us how much he loves us through God's indescribable gift. That that Jesus enters into the, the battered and broken pages of humanity to live a life that we could not live, a life of perfection, and and to taste of the bitter cup of death, to taste of the bitter cup of rejection, to be what? Verse 10. In our passage, this, this, uh, this wonderful word that is theologically weighty, he is our propitiation for our sins. What does this mean? Well, again, it's not the first time that John would bring up this very theme. In chapter 2, he talks about Jesus is the propitiation, and we come back to the repetition of this theme. What he repeats is what is emphasized in 1 John. A couple weeks ago, we had, Danielle and I did, we had our college students at our house on a Wednesday night. It's one of our village gatherings, and there's about 30, 35 college students that are over at the Eldridge residence, and we've got college students that are eating downstairs. We've got college students that are outside. We've got college students in the dining room and in the living room, and they're, they're eating full moon barbecue, and they're eating some of Danielle's amazing banana pudding. And in between bites, I'm walking around and I come to one of the tables and one of our college students asks me. Now, imagine the type of conversation they're having. Well, many college students are headed to school this week. Many college students will be headed back to school in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of conversation about who their roommates are, who their roommates aren't going to be. They're going to live on campus, they're going to live off campus. And so one of the college students, as I'm walking by, hey, says, Pastor David, I've got a question for you. So I'm thinking uh, that it's a question that is connected to a little more earthy kind of things. What was it like when you are in college, decades ago, those kinds of things. And the question was this. Hey, Pastor David, I've always wondered, what is propitiation? <laughs> just, a, just a light question. It's one of the things I love about our college students. It's one of the things I love about our church. I love that this, is a, this was a young lady who's 17, 18 years old, headed off to college, and she, she, wants, she wants to dive deep into God's word. Hey, I, I want to know what these theologically weighty words mean. I don't know exactly what I told her in that moment, but I tell you what I wish I would have told her is this. You know what propitiation is? It, it is how much God loves you. It is the extent to which God would display his love for you and me as sinners. 
You know what propitiation is all about? It, it, is, it is about the holiness of God who is a judge, a judge to all of our sin. And there is a price for sin. And we, we want this. You, you don't want to have an injustice that occurs to you and you go to a judge and a judge in the midst of all of the injustice says, no big deal. In the midst of you being the recipient of, of someone's sin, you don't want a judge in that moment that says, hey, Boys will be boys, girls will be boy, girls. Let's just, just pretend it didn't happen. Of course not. We know from a human level that there, there, there is a price for injustice. There must, must be something to, to rectify what has occurred here. And we can't just turn a blind eye to it. Well, if an infinite, loving, holy, perfect God looks upon our sin, he doesn't turn his eyes away from it, but he gazes in the fullness of it. And he as a holy God has a wrath against it. He hates sin. But this is how much he loves you. <laughs> that the one who knew no sin became sin to be the, the sacrificial substitute for us. That God loves us so much that this reservoir of love that flows from the Father and extends to the Son would extend to each and every one of us today as Jesus would, would live a perfect life and die a sacrificial death and he bore it all. He bore the full penalty of sin upon the cross. And to answer the question, what is propitiation, it isn't just an academic answer that we give to it. It is a part of the songs that we sing as the church. And we can go back into the, to the great well of hymns and we pull up songs like this that help us answer just how much he loves you. Here is love. Vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, on the mount of crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide, through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed, vast and gracious, a tide, grace and love, like mighty rivers poured incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world. In love. There's some of you that have walked into the sanctuary. And you know what it is to be kissed by the kiss of rejection. You know what it is to be left out, overlooked. You know what it is to have a friend or a family member reject you. For your extension that comes to them is not met with an open embrace, but it is met with rejection. And you're here wondering, will I be included? You need to hear this is how much God loves you. A love that always includes, a love that always brings you close. There's some of you that have walked into the sanctuary and you've been kissed by the bitter kiss of betrayal. And you've got two questions as you sit in this very sanctuary. Who can I trust and how can I trust? Can I tell you this morning that there's a love that will never drop you? There's a love that will never let you down. There is a love that will bring you close. There is a love that is deeper than any human betrayal that you experience. There's some of you here this morning that you've walked into the sanctuary and it, it is, you have been kissed by the kiss of grief itself. And the tears that you've shed over these last weeks are, are tears, they're tears of love, heartbreak. And you need to hear this morning that in the midst of your grief, in the midst of your sadness, there is a love from the Father that holds you close, even in your tears and pain. Let this wash over you today. Let this wash over you today. The, the words of the great Baptist British preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, over a century ago, looked into his congregation of over 5,000 in Metropolitan Tabernacle, and he said these very words, Christ loved you before all the worlds, long before the day star flung his ray across the darkness, before the wing of an angel had flapped the unnavigated ether, 
before all of creation had struggled from the womb of nothingness, God, even our God, had set his heart upon all his children. Since that time, has he once swerved? Since that time, has he once swerved? Has he once turned aside? Has he once changed? No. You who have tasted of his love and know his grace will bear witness that he has been a certain friend in uncertain circumstances. You have often left him. Has he ever left you? You've had many trials and troubles. Has he ever deserted you? Has he ever turned away his heart and shut up his bowels of compassion? No. Child of God, It is your solemn duty to say no and bear witness to his love, to bear witness to his faithfulness. Three questions from our text this morning. What is the nature of God? The second question is, how does God display his love to us? And finally this morning, how do we display the love of God? Again, look with me in our text in verse 12. No one has ever seen God If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. This is a passage that we never need to take in isolation. It's a passage that goes best with the passage that comes before us in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. John is saying something here that is is true. It's true as as, as old as time is, is that, that God is spirit and, and we do not see him in the same way that we perceive the person that is sitting next to you here this morning. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses would hear from God himself that, hey, you can't see my face for no one may see me and live. Well, how can he be known? How can a God who is spirit be known when we are not going to run into him in our, in our public shopping this afternoon here. Many of you are familiar over the last month, there's been a movie that's being filmed here in the greater Birmingham area, and they've been Kurt Russell spottings, the famous actor. They've been Matthew McConaughey spottings. People have, have lined up to be able to get a glimpse of, of this famous actor, and there's something about being able to see someone that you might see on the, on the big screen here. Now, will any of us here on earth, be able to happenstance run into someone at a restaurant who is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is invisible, the passage tells us. No one has ever seen God. But how does God show his power? How does God display his love? How does God show that he is alive? Is it through our airtight, precise Uh, arguments for the existence of God, well, heavens no. You know what it's through? Your love. My love. Our love. When we look at this passage right here, it reminds us the gospel, it motivates how do we love. It it shows us a path of how we display love to one another. There's a great Union University professor by the name of Ray Van Nest who talks about this very passage and how the gospel gives us, well, it gives us roads to travel when we show people love. He, God, loved us first. He didn't wait for us to make the first move. So our love is an initiating love. We, we don't wait solely to be the recipients of love. We, we, as Christians, we step out in love. He being God, he loved those who hated him. So we can't excuse ourselves from love because there's some people we disagree with or there's some people that are just too difficult for us. If a sinless God can love sinners like you and me, how much more so could, could we as sinful people surely love other sinful people? Notice in this passage here, he loved those who were different than him. Is there any greater distance between a human who is a sinner and a perfect God? Our love then is not just limited to those who are like us from the same zip code, the same profession, all graduates of the same school, the same worldviews, the same politics here. Of course not. Our love, it spills out across the, the sameness 
that often defines us in our world. His love continued, God's love, even when it wasn't convenient. We shaped by the gospel, we are called to love beyond our convenience. His love cost. None of us can bring about someone's salvation through our love. Of course, that has happened in Jesus and Jesus alone. But as we show love in this sacrificial way, it will cost. Don't, don't be misled. It, it will cost you your time. It will cost you your resources. At times, it will cost you your pride. The first church I ever pastored was over two decades ago. Miss Edna was a longtime member of the church, and she had been walking with her husband, Mr. Jimmy, for over five years with what at that time was a terminal diagnosis. And they held hands there in the ICU, and he breathed his last breath. And to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord, and she grieved. She grieved a grief that many of you in this room that have said, I do, till death do us part, know very well church rallied around her. Small church, just a few Sunday school classes, pillar member she was and her husband was. But they didn't just rally around her in those last weeks of her husband's life. They had been rallying around her for the five years of his diagnosis. They knew what it was to help around the house when she was taking her husband for treatments. They were church members that would just show up and cut Mr. Jimmy's yard just to help out. There are mills that just showed up at the house after weeks and weeks and weeks. They would just show up because this was a family that was loved by the people that called East Lawn Baptist Church home. Her husband passed away and there began to be plans made for his celebration, his funeral, celebration of life. Son came back. They only had one son. I met him for the first time. One of the first things that he told me was, hey, pastor, if it's okay with you, let's, let's, let's kind of lessen the Jesus stuff here. Let's don't make the sermon so Jesus-y. Would that be okay? Now, Miss Edna had told me about him. I knew about him. I knew his name because uh, on Wednesday nights when we'd have prayer meetings, she would ask for prayers for her son, a son that had left the faith that had been passed down to him, a son that was living in, 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 in the foreign land of, of disbelief but a son that was loved by his mom and his dad, a son that was loved by the church that he grew up in. We had the service and I understood, I think what he meant by, they don't make it so Jesus-y, I think what he meant in that is, hey, let's not have an altar call, let's not have an invitation, but at the end of the day, we celebrated his dad's life because there was so much of an indelible imprint that he had made upon all of the people that were there in that community, but also we celebrated Jesus because there is no hope in life or in death other than what has been accomplished in and through Jesus the end of the service, we were in the fellowship hall below the sanctuary, kind of akin to the setup we have here at Dawson. And the son came up to me. I was a little bit nervous about what his reaction to the service was going to be. Maybe if he had a little bit of frustration about the service, but he didn't have that. He looked around the sanctuary and his words were words that have always stayed with me. He said, you know, I don't know, preacher, what I think about all this Christianity stuff. But pointing to a fellowship hall filled with people that loved his mom and loved his dad, he said, this I know for sure. They love Jesus. They love my mom. And they love my dad. And I looked at him and said, you're exactly right. They love your mom. They loved your dad. And they love you. Did he see God that day? Did he behold on what is unbeholdable this side of heaven? Did he stare into the holy countenance of God the Father here on earth? The answer to that question is no. But did he see God at work in the ordinary love of people? And the answer is a resounding yes. Yes. And that witness, those stories, 
get repeated again and again and again. Well, they get repeated in your life, in this church, in your love. Let us pray.